Good evening, everyone, and welcome to LSE for this public event on the economics of drug policy. My name is Danny Kwa, and it's my privilege and pleasure to get to chair this LSE Ideas Expert Group working on the economics of drug policy and to be your chair this evening. This expert group and all the LSE Ideas staff have worked hard to produce the report that we are publishing today and that we will be presenting this evening. For those of you in the audience who are avid Twitter users, as I hope you can see, tonight's hashtag is LSE Drug Policy. At LSE, we encourage you to continue tweeting while the event goes on, but as a courtesy to everyone else, if you could just put your phones on silent, or at least work it so that it doesn't ring in the middle of a presentation. Our report called Ending the Drug Wars, <coughs> the Economics of Drug Policy, represents, in our view, the most far-reaching independent analysis of the current international drug control strategy yet undertaken. This report is a continuation of LSE's ideas work following the release of our earlier 2012 report called Governing the Global Drug Wars. Drug policy today is at a critical point. Cash-strapped governments facing fiscal austerity worldwide are re-examining carefully how they spend money. Central and Latin American governments, most significantly, have called for a re-evaluation of the current war on drugs. Given the enormous costs of this war and its apparent failure to achieve its stated goal, a drug-free world. President Molina of Guatemala, as a sitting president, has brought the issue to state level. He was initially scheduled to attend to receive this report. Now, unfortunately, at the last minute, President Perez Molina had to cancel his trip to the United Kingdom and so is unable to attend this evening. In his stead, His Excellency, Minister Mauricio Lopez Bonilla, Minister in the Cabinet of the Government of Guatemala, in charge of all security-related matters, is here tonight to receive the report on behalf of his President, who will then be taking the report to the UN General Assembly and other international forums. Before I present the report to the Minister, I would like quickly to outline its core findings. This report puts together the contributions by a group of outstanding international scholars and academics. The individual contributions in the report examine different specific aspects of the current global drug strategy. Taken as a whole, these contributions emphasize for us how there are no quick or simple ways to resolve this extremely complicated issue. At the same time, however, the report also shows clear ways to improve international drug policy right away. These begin with the recognition that in their current form, the global war on drugs is not the way to manage the global drug problem. The UN drug control system must recognize that continuing a one-size-fits-all, strict prohibitionist approach is neither appropriate nor politically sustainable. Instead, our report argues for three principal changes. Individual states should reallocate resources away from enforcement-led and repressive policies and towards public health policies 
based on reducing harm and providing access to treatment. Second, instead of blanket interdiction and eradication policies, states should focus on minimizing the impacts of illicit markets on producer and transit countries, as well as focus on promoting human security and protecting fundamental human rights. Third, states should pursue rigorously monitored policy and regulatory experimentation. Such experimentation is already currently underway on cannabis in Washington State and Colorado in the United States and in Uruguay, but is also being examined internationally in the case of different so-called psychoactive substances. Our warning is that if the international community doesn't work together to reform the current system, individual states will be compelled to push ahead unilaterally. Circumstances have reached a point where there is no alternative. But these individual unilateral actions will repudiate the coordinating opportunities afforded by the United Nations. International cooperation, we feel, is essential. Going it alone will not achieve the best that the world can do. Economics and international relations scholars might note here a parallel with other global problems. Global climate change, trade imbalance, quantitative easing as monetary policy, possibly destabilizing the emerging world. So that perhaps in parallel with the modern global supply chain, offloading rich country carbon emission to poor economy manufacturing. Today, potentially, a US-centered war on drugs could be outsourcing tragic violence to Colombia, Mexico, and elsewhere in the global south. The United Nations should shift to a role of global facilitator enabling discussion and cooperation. It should focus on conducting research, evaluating policy outcomes, and disseminating the evidence in an impartial way. Finally, it must become an unreserved advocate for protecting the fundamental human rights and dignity of people, both in consuming and producing countries, as well as in transit countries. People who use drugs and people who are otherwise caught up in the global drug supply chain. The UN General Assembly Special Session on Drug Policy in 2016 provides an enormous opportunity to refashion the global drug strategy. We hope that this report published today will help drive some of the discussion there surrounding the UN meeting and will help inform member states in some of their policy choices. I want to thank all the members of the expert group for their outstanding contributions to this publication and in general for their good cheer and goodwill in the collaboration on this project. I want to thank all the esteemed signatories who have signed off, but significantly have helped guide the direction of study in this report. Most of all, I want to thank Team Ideas, in particular John Collins, who as report editor and expert group coordinator did a sterling job putting this significant publication together. Minister, I am just about to present you with the report now. But just before I do that, if I may, 
I would like to play a video of your president. Señoras y señores, buenos días. Es un gran honor poder... Ladies and gentlemen, very good evening. It's a great honor to greet you from Guatemala given the delivery of this report finalizing the drug against drug from the LSE and especially from the group of experts on the, uh, f on the economics of drug policy, without any doubt, the points of view and the conclusions in this report will receive a lot of attention and they will have relevance in all the international discussions on reforming drug policy in such a way that I feel very honored and, and grateful by the authorities of the London School, School of Economics for having the opportunity to uh, receive this report and to make some few comments on its results and statements, especially on the initiative of Guatemala in the uh, international sphere and the American uh, hemisphere that the reform of the global drug policy should be a reality at medium and long term. Allow me to highlight that Guatemala is today essentially a transit country for drugs traffic that go from the south to the north in our hemisphere, although with time, the, indeed, the production has been growing of poppy fields and the, our programs of drugs derive essentially from the geographical circumstances of finding ourselves halfway between producing countries and consuming countries in our hemisphere. Being a transit country, therefore, we suffer especially from the problem of, of the uh, uh, drug trafficking organizations, both national and foreign, which in order to obtain the greatest benefit, they fight among themselves and with the security forces for the control of the routes and territories, and they have generated a high level of corruption, crime, and violence in our country. It, along these lines, as it has been said on, the ramp, on one part of the report, the transit countries, we have seen ourselves uh, forced to follow the guideline and to uh, take up the cost of the policies implemented by consuming countries, especially in what relates to the redu reducing the supply. And yet, uh, despite the, some of the successes in this area, we have not managed, nonetheless, to resolve definitely the problem of drug traffic that we we are uh, facing, and we feel that we shall not do so unless an important change from our part happens, not only in our internal policies, but also given our situation of transit country in the policies of producing countries as well as consuming countries, or in other words, the, poly the global drug policy. And this is why Guatemala has a priority and special interest in reforming the drug policy. And this is also why, with the support of many countries that share our concerns, we shall continue to promote actively this topic in the various international fora. Uh, simultaneously to the international debate today, many countries have started to experience different drug policies and Guatemala is observing carefully and, and backs up as well the initiatives and of the policies that are being implemented. And they base themselves in a number of the principles and criteria which I mentioned before. I value positively, and I have said expressly my, uh, said my support developed by these uh, of the policies of these countries who look for more efficient and efficacious results on the problem of drugs. Who they also look to correct and avoid the problems that derive and the damage, the collateral damage that comes with traditional policies of prohibitionism have created in different places in the world. I think that the new global response to the drug problem cannot be indifferent neither 
to, to associated to the national uh, various efforts that are being already carried out, uh, without any doubt, we must bear in mind that something is already being done, and especially those good practices and strategies which generate effective results in the various countries where they are implemented. Ladies and gentlemen, I express my satisfaction and acknowledgement for this important contribution of the London School, London School of Economics to the global debate on the drugs problem. I consider that the contents of the report itself must be uh, shared not only by academics and researchers, but also the government world and non-governmental world politicians, uh, senior uh, civil servants, and uh, as well as researchers and leaders of institutions, of NGOs, for example, they must continue be involved in this important matter of the global age, um, agenda. Being this a recognized institution and a respected institution at the global level, this report from the expert group from the London School of Economics on the economics of the drug policy, not only will, sh will throw new light on topics already dealt with, but also it will allow to focus other important matters which are already, which are still pending in the discussion and debate, in the international debate. We celebrate this important contribution to continue the discussion of the reform of the global drug policies. Thank you very much, and a cordial greetings from Guatemala. With great pleasure that I present to you this report from the LSE Expert Group on the Economics of Drug Policy. And we look forward to working with your government and others on implementing the proposals and engaging in further discussion. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. May I invite you now to make a few words? To, to make it a short statement. Thank you. Very good evening. Very good evening. First of all, I'd like to say that it is for me a great honor not only to receive this report. Uh, uh, on behalf of the President of the Republic, Otto Fernández Pérez Molina, President of the Republic of uh, uh, Guatemala, but also to share this, uh, this uh, podium with you in an institution which has become an icon of academic excellency, excellence at global level. It's an honor and I feel proud to be here with you. Thank you for the hospitality. The President has asked me to uh, give a few words of thanks and to define some lines on what we consider is the contribution Guatemala would like to make from the political point of view to promote the debate and the analysis for revising the uh, global drugs policy. First of all, is to say that a month and a half after uh, President Otto Perez had taken, assumed uh, um, the presidency, he threw for the first time a call to revise and question the prohibitionist model of fight against drugs because he thought that this uh, hitherto, in the last 40 years, has been ineffectual as far as the aims that they had stated. But secondly, because he also thought it was important to make visible the situation of the transit countries like Guatemala, because uh, hitherto it had only been Mm, said as uh, something 
proper of the market uh, approach, producing countries that have a supply and consuming countries that provide the demand. But in the middle between the two, as the report uh, so well states, are the transit countries. The transit countries forced to uh, fight within the framework of the prohibitionist model, which represents a high opportunity cost to carry out a struggle which, on the first hand, is not even ours, does not belong to us. Secondly, that we see the need to use the meager resources we have, which could well be invested in health and education, to invest them in a drug war policy. And thirdly, that on top of having to use our resources, we are permanently under the warning of fire economic sanctions if we do not meet the capture uh, volumes, drug volumes, um, which would, uh, through the certification mechanism, mean that the country will have sanctions, which uh, gives us, as uh, to us, as a transit country, which, uh, with a stated that we demand as so, the problems, because our geographical situation it implies that we are in a route that we didn't choose to be in, in a war we didn't choose to be in, in an governmental action and investment, which is not good for us, for which we are not recognized, neither are we uh, retributed on that. On the contrary, we see, we see ourselves threatened if we don't participate. Our problem is not a problem of consumption. There is a small problem we consider as ours, which is that we have to look uh, within the framework of these new alternatives an integral solution. It's a geographical area, Guatemala, where conditions are given of a microclimate for the production of poppy. And this, in 35 years, has constituted now a uh, obviously a growth which has a social cultural impact and that our eradication policies have not reached the minimum objective. We cannot continue under a prohibitionist model that establishes, for example, in the legislation and in the country that that any contribution of drugs, drugs for consumption, for sale, for, for uh, marketing in place prison without having a substitutional measure on this. This obviously uh, implies a collapsed penitentiary system and not being able to deal appropriately with a topic that could indeed be a matter of public health and not really a matter of public security. Under those conditions, therefore, to raise a standard in order to question the prohibitionist model and to talk about the possibilities of starting a, an analysis of revising the global drugs policy implies to define actions that could go along the lines of depenalization, decriminalization, or along the lines of legalization, as some countries, or many countries are already doing, doing uh, around the world. To define this, this is not new, but to define it from, from the power exercise as a president, the pronouncements had either to been of ex-presidents in the area of uh, uh, Latin America. Now, two presidents in, uh, in Latin America, Juan Manuel Santos in Colombia and, and Otto Perez Molina in Guatemala have referred to this topic, and Guatemala wants to assume it with all this responsibility and wants to raise its standard and, above all, to consider that in many occasions, the formulation of, of public policies at the national level or formulation of regional policies in the case of uh, the drug war have not had the necessary academic and intellectual substance for them to be realistic in the strategies thus formulated. And the 
the purpose now is that the intellectual and the academic contributions of experts can actually be taken to real policy, to uh, public policy, to defining actions that can indeed develop new alternatives in the fight against drugs, and to give the right place to where each one belongs. And I finally say that the status of a transit country states, therefore, the need to talk about a shared responsibility and a differentiated responsibility where not all of us have the same capacities, have the same resources, neither do we have the same vision. To have the opportunity to uh, uh, to uh, disagree in a model like today uh, of dissent can Im imply m many things, but for us this is the current route, the correct way, the way, the moment in which we can question in order to create and define better alternatives in a in a fight which is indeed integral. And it's been an honor being with you. I, I feel proud to receive this, this uh, report. And I can assure you that's going to be a big tool that Guatemala will promote at the regional level, not only within the framework of our body, the regional, uh, the Organization of American States, where uh, some uh, echo uh, on this has been done, but also the the uh, CELAC and uh, the Central American Organization as well, we're going to lead on matters of security so that this can effectively be a contribution from, a, uh, as I said, a prestigious and icon uh, academic institution at the world level. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and thank you very much for the opportunity to share and receive this report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We will now turn to two experts to speak to us on their views of this problem. They have decided to speak from the table. What I will do is say a few words to introduce the, each of them before I turn over the microphone to them. First, we will have Dr. Kaisha Malinowska, who will you will see in a second, speak on a public health approach to drug policy. Dr. Kasha directs the Open Society Global Drug Policy Program. This program encourages greater scrutiny of international drug policy, and it provides grants to advance evidence-based approaches to drug policy worldwide. Kasha is a major contributor to the debate on the relation between drug use and HIV infection. She previously headed the Open Society International Harm Reduction Development Program, first introducing and then scaling up access to needle exchange and substitution treatment across Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Before joining Open Society, Kasha had worked for the United Nations Development Program in New York and then in Warsaw, developing training programs for medical, prison, and police workers, and managing outreach programs on harm reduction, women's health, HIV, medical ethics, and drug use. Kasha received the Norman E. Zinberg Award for the achievement in the field of medicine in 2007, and the Gold Order Medal from the Polish Ministry of Justice in 2000 for her work on HIV in prisons. If you could join me in welcoming Kasia to LSE. Thank you very much for uh, this kind introduction and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. It's an honor for me to uh, share a panel with such distinguished individuals. Um, I hope everyone in the room reads this report closely because it offers a comprehensive outline of what is at stake when we think and talk about drug policy. 
thanks to a group of Latin American leaders from Guatemala, Colombia, and Mexico, this debate is heading to the United Nations General Assembly. So if the report identifies the problem, the question has to be asked, can the UN offer a solution? Can the UN fix broken drug policies? It's a very tall task. We spend the day today talking about it. The drug control system is hardwired into a global machinery. We've got global drug control agencies and entire parts of governments devoted to the status quo. To say nothing of the three international treaties that more or less uphold the system. Can we, including activists, well-meaning officials, scholars, approach the UN with public health crisis and instability and ask to navigate around outdated international conventions. Not only we can, but we already have. In 2001, with the world reeling from the global AIDS crisis, public health activists and few brave governments questioned the terrible status quo, which assumed that expensive aid drugs cannot be available to the millions who were dying of AIDS in the global south. Thanks to what we did then, the number of AIDS-related deaths declined by nearly one-third from 2005 to 2011, and eight million people in low- and middle-income countries are currently receiving HIV treatment. I would offer a couple of lessons learned from the experience of the UN General Assembly session on AIDS. First, we need leadership. Then the UN Secretary General, Kofi Annan, understood the gravity of the situation. He understood the misery of children watching their parents die awful, degrading deaths and looked for solutions that were outside of the box. The Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria was created as a result, a fund sitting outside of the UN. This was a brave and controversial move by the UN Secretary General who understood that UN agencies will not take on pharmaceutical industries that were charging 15,000 US dollars for a, year, for a yearly supply of life-saving medicines. It is precisely this out-of-the-box leadership that we need today for drug policy reform. And we are seeing this leadership emerge. Latin American leaders have put drug policy on the international agenda. That's why we're here today. They've done their part. Now we need Europe to stand up too. We need Europe to be proud of its public health programs that, ha that have managed to contain the HIV that is out of control in Russia, for example. We need governments that decriminalize drugs and emptied prisons, like Portugal, to stand up and celebrate their achievements. Governments in Switzerland, Germany, Spain, the cities of Vancouver or, or Copenhagen that opened the doors of clinics to people who use drugs and gave them a safe space to inject. They should brag that they reduced overdose and HIV transmission. These smart, brave policymakers should be asking their counterparts across the entire world, and why not you? Second, while we're heading for the UN, the solutions might come from outside of the UN. A few spoke, outspoken government officials, along with AIDS activists across the world, articulated clearly that a life in the global south is as valuable as it is in the global north, and that not offering life-saving treatments violates human rights and is simply immoral. They took on the World, Health, World WTO and again came up with an out-of-the-box solutions of the public health emergency which allowed Brazil, India and Thailand to produce generic AIDS medicines. We're seeing this out-of-the-box thinking now in the area of drug policy as governments are introducing policies that are in tension with the drug control treaties. Many of our allies are guardians of international standards and norms. And we understand, we respect your position. But if you do not fix this broken system from the inside, governments will have no choice by to, but to depart from the entire regime and act very much outside of it. And they would be right to do so, 
because the costs of doing nothing is too high. And that's the importance of this report. It counts the costs. Anyone who reads this and thinks it is only about drug policy is missing the point. It is about public health and the millions of drug users becoming infected with HIV, even though it is entirely preventable. It is about the million of in prisons and jails for minor drug offenses, especially so if they, if they are ethnic minorities or if they're poor. It is about hundreds of thousands that are abused behind barbed wires in the, no, no, in the name of what we call drug treatment. It is about cruelty that goes along with denying medical cannabis treatment to children with epilepsy or opioids for pain management. And it is about the communities that live with violence driven by illicit markets, the creation of which are functions of the global drug control system. In 2001, the world had to face AIDS orphans. And now we ask them to face orphans of the prison industrial complex and drug war violence. In 2001, HIV activists had to stare down international trade agreements. And now we stare down three drug control treaties. In 2001, we had to square off with Big Pharma, and now we're looking at the entrenched drug war interest, which includes the prison industry, drug war agencies, and others. 2001 was important for the AIDS movement. 15 years later, we have an opportunity to make 2016 as important to the drug policy movement. All of you, whether students, faculty, or people outside of the academia, but especially those of you who understand policy, have a role to play. The report calls for development of an international strategy fit for the 21st century. And that is right. That is what we need. And I hope you help us make this a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Kasha. Our next speaker is Professor Mark Kleiman. Mark is Professor of Public Policy at the UCLA School, Luskin School of Public Affairs. Mark's research focuses on drug abuse and crime control policy with an emphasis on maximizing the behavioral effects of deterrent threats while minimizing the application of actual punishment. Mark edits the Journal of Drug Policy Analysis, and he serves on the Committee of Law and Justice of the US National Research Council. He is the author of a good number of books, including When Brute Force Fails, How to Have Less Crime and Less Punishment, named by the, our very own Economist newspaper as one of 2009's Books of the Year. He is co-author with, among other people, Jonathan Calkin, who is here in the audience, of Drugs and Drug Policy and of Marijuana Legalization. Beyond his academic work, Mark provides advice on crime control and drug policy to governments around the world through Botec Analysis Corporation. In this capacity, he has advised the Washington State Liquor Control Board on the implementation of a legal market for cannabis. He has taken, field, he has taken policy positions with the U.S. Department of Justice and the city of Boston. If you could join me in welcoming Mark to LSE. Danny, thank you very much for that generous introduction. And again, thanks to John Collins for setting up the, not only the report, but the conference. It's been, a, it's been a tremendous pleasure to be here, and it's a great honor to serve on this panel. Um, reading the Economist's statement that serves as a preface to the report, I was reminded of a comment that I believe Gladstone make, made, but I may be wrong about that, about Macaulay. He said, I wish I were certain of anything 
as Macaulay is about everything. Um, I wish I were certain as either the drug warriors who are not, not represented here tonight or the drug policy reformers that I knew exactly the right thing to do about drugs policy. Um, I hope in the, in the time I have to convince you, not of a particular point of view, but to convince you this is hard and complicated rather than a simple question of taking up the right against the wrong. The economist statement uh, has its, as its theme uh, the following sentence, the war on drugs has failed. When I hear that coming from a group of economists, I wonder whether they've asked the basic economist's question, which is, of course, compared to what? The failure of an existing policy to generate adequate, acceptable results uh, does not demonstrate the availability of a politically and operationally feasible alternative policy. Uh, that would have better outcomes. In imagining the drug policy problem, it seems to me the correct principle is that of global or aggregate harm minimization. We're looking to minimize the total damage done by substance use disorder in all its forms, both to drugs users and to other people. Um, minimize those costs plus the costs of the control effort directed at uh, controlling the drug problem. Uh, Dr. Malowski has given us an eloquent account of the costs of the control regime. Um, and I, no sane person would deny that, though many eminent persons do deny it. Uh, but that leaves out the potential costs of alternative regimes. So let me contrast two drugs. Cocaine today generates enormous control costs around the world, not least in transit countries such as Guatemala. Um, it generates at the same time relatively modest abuse costs because it's relatively rarely used. Alcohol, by contrast, generates almost no abuse costs at all. I don't know how many people were murdered last year in the course of the illicit alcohol production and trafficking business, or how many alcohol traffickers are behind bars. But I could probably count both of those numbers on my fingers. So from that perspective, the legalization of alcohol in the US, one of the few countries that tried to prohibit it, has been an enormous success. The costs of alcohol control went to close to zero. Not only don't we have much illicit alcohol production in the US, we have virtually no enforcement effort against illicit alcohol production because the illicit market simply can't compete with illicit market. So hooray for us. On the other hand, alcohol abuse kills about 100,000 Americans a year. Some of those people are themselves in the grip of substance use disorder. They die of chronic disease, including cirrhosis of the liver, but actually numerically more significantly, heart disease, stroke, uh, and a variety of, of chronic digestive diseases. Alcohol, after all, is a toxin to every tissue and organ of the body. So some of them die of chronic disease, very small number die of acute alcohol overdose, though a much larger number die, die of the use of some other drug in combination with alcohol and acute poisoning incidents. Um, a very large number die from suicide. Uh, of the people who try to commit suicide, relatively few are drunk at the time. Of the people who succeed in committing suicide, a much larger number are drunk at the time. And the evidence is that most people who try suicide while drunk, even in some very convincing way, some way that's not merely a gesture, if they happen to fail, will later regret the attempt and be glad that it didn't work. They will not, in fact, go on to kill themselves. Then there are the more dramatic costs of alcohol abuse 
in the forms of homicide and automobile accident and other accident, and the uncounted costs of alcohol abuse to the families, friends, neighborhoods, and coworkers of those in its grip. Um, approximately half of the violent crime in the United States is committed by people who are drunk at the time. Uh, and about half the people in prison in the United States were drunk at the time they did whatever it was they went to prison for. So the con contribution of drug prohibition to the incarceration problem is substantial. The, co the contribution of alcohol legalization to the mass incarceration problem is substantially greater than that. So our goal should be to minimize aggregate harm, the sum of abuse costs plus control costs. Or to think about it a different way, this is a formulation I owe to my friend Professor Rob McCoon at Berkeley. We could think of decomposing the costs imposed by any drug on its users and other people in the following way. The total harm, the aggregate harm, is the product of two figures. The harmfulness of the drug, the amount of damage it does per user or per gram or per use incident, times the volume, again, defined in various ways. So it's the harmfulness times the prevalence. If we can reduce either of those, we can reduce aggregate harm as long as we don't increase the other more than proportionately. A very straightforward way to reduce aggregate drug-related harm would be to raise the tax on alcohol, a policy that requires putting nobody in prison, crashing through nobody's doors, limiting nobody's liberty. And yet, almost every place in the world, alcohol taxes are grossly lower than the costs alcohol imposes, even on non-drinkers. In the US, I've calculated that the average drink, which is taxed at about 10 cents, produces about a dollar and a half of damage to non-drinkers. Now, that's not because the average drink produces any damage at all. It's the drinking by a relatively small number of problem drinkers that impose those costs, but those costs are very great indeed. So, for the currently listed drugs, alcohol and tobacco, we have control options. Taxation is one of them. Identifying problem users and requiring them or helping them to quit is another. Um, in South Dakota, uh, drunk drivers are required to take breathalyzer tests twice a day with a threat of a night in jail every time they test positive. Doing that reduces their drunk driving recidivism by 50% for the next two years, even though the program only lasts for 90 days. And when that program is introduced at a county level, uh, Bo Kilmer at Rand has reported that you see a measurable countywide reduction in the incidence of domestic violence. Even though the program isn't a domestic violence program at all, turns out if you take bad drinkers and make them stop drinking, you reduce lots of social harms. So as we discuss what we might do about the currently prohibited drugs, let's not forget about the enormous costs that are exacted by the currently prohibited, permitted drugs. Um, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, we should also note that without changing any of the current drugs laws, without allowing anything to be legal that's currently illegal, there are options for enormously reducing the damage done by drug abuse and drug control. So for example, we could shift our enforcement efforts, particularly in source and transit countries, away from the feudal effort to reduce the flow of drugs and toward the quite practicable objective of reducing the violence associated with drug markets. The largest cost faced by an illegal drug dealing organization is the cost of enforcement. If we can apportion our enforcement to specifically the violent drug dealing organizations, we can create a very substantial disincentive to violence while also exerting a kind of Darwinian pressure on the drug market by eliminating the most violent dealers. Now, the de details of that would require some thought, um, but that's an opportunity that can be done without any permission from any of the international drug control bodies. Um, at the same time, the parallel program to the 
uh, South Dakota alcohol program, which is called Sobriety 24-7, um, drug testing and sanctions for drug-involved offenders on community supervision, um, what's called in the United, the United States probation uh, for people who haven't been to prison and parole for those who have. Um, turns out that that approach reduces their illicit drugs consumption by something like 80% while sending remarkably few of them to, prison, to jail for more than a couple of days at a time. So there's another huge opportunity to reduce the damage done by drug consumption in consumer nations, and because those drug-involved offenders, who are a very small minority of illicit drug users, consume the vast bulk of the drugs, that's the best opportunity the final consumer countries have to reduce the pressure that their citizens' drug habits put on source and transit countries. So those are two enormous opportunities to reduce drug-related harm within the context of the current drugs laws. So now let me talk about what I was asked to talk about, which is how to design cannabis legalization. Um, and uh, as, as Danny Kwan mentioned, I was involved in the effort and hope to stay involved in the effort in Washington state to do that. What are the effects of natural effects of legalization? I'm gonna concentrate now on cannabis, which seems to me the drug that's most likely to be legalized and is most e easily and straightforwardly legalized. Natural effects of legalization are a very substantial decrease in price. My, my friend and colleague, John Hawkins, who's in the audience, has computed that industrial scale farming efforts could produce joints for on the order of two cents. Um, at, at least one order of magnitude, probably two orders of magnitude, lower than the current cost. Um, at that very low price, one would expect a very great increase in consumption. By the way, just in case you think that's implausible, um, I bought in the United States a month ago um, 100 grams of Twining's English breakfast tea. Right, that's the dried leaves and flowers of a plant. That 100 grams of tea from a brand name manufacturer in a grocery store cost me $4.49. Four and a half cents a gram. So John's number doesn't look too far off. At that sort of price, one would expect a massive increase, not in casual cannabis use, because if you're a cannabis casual user, your cannabis consumption doesn't cost you enough to bother you. Right? Under, under illegality, it costs about two American dollars in America to get stoned. So the Doritos cost more <laughs> than the cannabis. I don't believe that ca casual use will go up at all with price decrease. The people who use a lot more cannabis are people who are already using too much cannabis. So it seems to me that a crucial policy detail of legalization is to keep the price up. Legalization will also shift the balance of information, right? Now potential drug users get mostly drug war propaganda. Not very effective, but still that's what they get. They get very little encouragement in any official channel, any formal channel, to use whatever the drug is. Contrast consumers of, say, tobacco or alcohol. And that information effect of legalization wouldn't merely affect marketing effort. Advertising supported mass media, which is to say all mass media, are likely to be much less aggressive in publicizing the harms done by the products sold by their advertisers. Witness the great passivity of both print and electronic media about the smoking problem uh, in the 1960s and the alcohol problem even today. Of course, legalization also changes the availability of the drugs, the quality, um, the social consequences of using them, um, customs, fashions, and habits. All of those things then would be expected to increase consumption uh, to some substantial extent. A big unknown is what the effect would be on the use of other drugs. Again, there's great certainty in the world about this. The drug warriors all know that cannabis is a gateway drug and therefore making it legal will lead to more abuse of all other drugs. And the drug policy reformers know that cannabis is a substitute for alcohol and therefore cannabis legalization will reduce the extent of heavy drinking. I don't know either of those things. 
Um, I think the research is, existing research, completely inconclusive, because of course it can't be done with respect to the relevant question, which is what cannabis as a legal product would do to heavy drinking. All I can tell you is what happens to small changes under illegality. So the question of cross-elasticity, as the economists say, is not one I think that can be answered with the existing data. And as Werner Heisenberg and Yogi Berra agree, predictions are dangerous, especially about the future. <laughs> the key policy details, again, the price matters, right? We see in the Netherlands, legal availability or quasi-legal availability of cannabis to adults, no substantially increase in cannabis use or problem cannabis use. But that's because the production, partly because the production side has been left strictly illegal, and therefore the prices in the Netherlands are roughly the same as the prices in the UK. So all you have is the effect of legal availability, and the Netherlands restricts marketing. So there aren't billboards, there aren't TV ads. Have you gotten wasted recently? Um, you could control price with taxation, with production quotas, or with minimum unit pricing based on THC content. Um, you can control information flows by, both by restricting marketing in countries that allow that. The US uh, current interpretations of the Constitution may not allow that. But also by the information flows from the government and from uh, the, the, the third sector. Um, an idea that I would like to see in the debate, um, and Steve Rawls re remind me today, this, this is in uh, the Transform Drug po Drugs Policy Report from 2009, is a user set personal consumption quota. You want to be a cannabis consumer, you have to sign up for that. Maybe you have to pass a little test indicating that you know the risks. And having done that, the clerk says to you, congratulations, okay, you're now a registered cannabis consumer. As you'll recall from your test, 10 milligrams is roughly what it takes to get stoned if you're not a tolerant user. Um, how often do you want to allow yourself to do that every month? What quota would you like to set for yourself? You can change that quota on two weeks notice, but until and unless you change it, it's binding. And if you've bought your monthly amount, the clerk at the cannabis store will have to say to you, I'm sorry, I can't serve you till the first of the month. Now, I have no idea how many people would become mindful of their cannabis use as a result of that, and how many people who hit their quota one month would, instead of saying, well, I'll just set myself a higher quota for the future, say, wait a second, I'm using more cannabis than I plan to use. Maybe I shouldn't increase my quota. Now, I want to claim that this is a policy that infringes no one's liberty, since the user can set and reset the quota, simply a way of getting the consumer's long-term considered interest in his cannabis use, some fighting chance about it against his short-term impulse to get stoned. Um, the other main policy detail to think about is industry structure. In the US, the states that have legalized have done so on the basis of commercial sales, more or less on the alcohol model. Uruguay has gone in a completely different direction towards something like a state monopoly. Additional options would be consumer-owned co-ops, as in the case of the Spanish cannabis clubs, not-for-profit institutions. Well, you could require that the public benefit corporations only to sell on a not-for-profit basis. The notion is not to have smart people getting rich by encouraging other people to become dependent. Um, <laughs> it's worth reflecting not only on the nature of an optimal cannabis policy, but it's on its political sustainability or not. The political economy of legalized vice has proven problematic for every vice that we've legalized. The problem is, first, the power of the industry and the possibility of regulatory capture that the commercial interest will take over from the public interest in shaping policies. We've seen that very dramatically with alcohol policy around the world. Um, and second, the basic problem of the industry, 
which is that casual use generates no substantial volume of sales. The revenue base of any industry that sells something that forms a bad habit is the people who have the bad habit. From their point of view, substance use disorder is not a diagnosis, it's their target demographic. And therefore, we should expect their marketing effort and their lobbying muscle to be used to prevent any attempt to prevent substance abuse with respect to their pet substance. Um, and that's the reason I take the industry structure to be so important. If we get locked into a legalized industry, I think our chances of maintaining sensible control policies get to be very, very, very remote. Um, And again, I want, to think, I want to offer alcohol and tobacco control as bad examples. Now, whether nonetheless legalization turns out to be better than the existing prohibition depends on several things. It depends on whether we make sensible changes within the realm of the existing prohibition to greatly reduce the damage that's done and that's testified to in the report that we're submitting today. It depends on facts about the world that we don't know, like what fraction of new cannabis users would develop substance use disorder, or how many of them would then stop heavy drinking as a result. It depends on details of policy that aren't fully under our control. And of course, it depends on viewpoint, right? Not hard to see that getting rid of global drug prohibition would be a great gain for Guatemala under almost any circumstance. Just hard to see what the risks are to Guatemala that could be nearly as bad as what it has today. Uh, from the point of view of consumer countries, the arithmetic is different. So what I would like to submit to you is that as we move forward, we should do so in fear and trembling and in an experimental mood rather than a dogmatic mood. This is a wonderful moment to get rid of some of the excesses of the drug war and the dogmatic thinking that he's accompanied it. It's a very bad moment to substitute instead another form of dogmatic thinking. We should proceed with adequate deference, both to the risks and to how much we don't know and need to find out. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, in other audiences, the statement that we don't know enough and more work needs to be done might be taken as anathema to a position that the speaker wishes to propose. But at the LSE, in the spirit of ongoing research, in the spirit of ongoing dialogue, this is exactly music to our ears because more work needs to be done. And we need to be the ones to carry forwards that investigation. What I would like to do now is to open the conversation to the audience. So we will have a Q&A session. While you're thinking about what questions, how exactly you want to pose that, let me just set out some of the constraints that we need to be under. We're under a tight, tight time restriction, so we will have to end this um, you know, promptly. But having said that, there's still opportunity to get a good conversation going. If you do have a question, Put up your hand, make yourself known to, to me. I am the dictator in this little session. Make yourself known to me. I will invite our lovely stewards to get a microphone to you. When you get the microphone, pose your question in a concise way. Uh, I would like to get as many questions going as possible. I would like to collect three, four questions before I unleash the wisdom of the panel on your questions. Um, this is a session on ending the global drug wars. So everyone up here has spoken on that topic. Unless yours is a question that deals with a very specific drill down research type issue, there's no need to say that your question is directed to a specific individual. Everyone up here will have interesting opinions on what you've just asked. In return, 
although it's exam time now at LSE, this in here is not an examination situation. So our panelists should feel no compunction about trying to get extra credit on the questions that you've set by addressing every single point. After we've collected a range of questions, I will invite the panel to speak to the points that they see most useful to carry the conversation forwards. So if the stewards are ready, I know that there's a question right up here, right in the middle, and I'll try and dis distribute across the room. So right up here in the middle, the gentleman in the blue jumper. And again, we will collect three or four questions before you, we get you to answer them. Hi, thank you very much, and, and thanks very much to the panel. Um, some of the panelists mentioned Washington, the, some of the policy, well, change in policy which has happened in Washington and Colorado, uh, Uruguay and other places, um, and also the interdiction and eradication efforts which have been um, controversial in some cases, like Plan Colombia. Um, but no explicit mention was made of the United States, which some might see um, as the major obstacle to success of a global rethink of drugs policy internationally. So I'd, I'd ask the, que the, the question to the panel, um, to what extent do you think actually that, that a major rethink is only possible when you get a change in public policy and public opinion at a larger level in the United States, um, which is a place where, where you know, um, on the one hand you've got Colorado and, and Washington, on the other hand you've still got mandatory sentencing which causes Great control costs. Um, thank you. Thank you for your question. So the gentleman in the corner. Hi, my question has to do with the fact that um, all of these drugs that we talk about as being illicit, they do have therapeutic values also. People have mentioned the use of medical marijuana, opioids also, which uh, are in shortage uh, for in many countries, and also there's the problem of chronic pain, where people do not receive adequate treatment. Is there also, in changing drug policy, uh, a necessary change in public perception of what these substances are? That they're not merely uh, recreational drugs, but they're also medicine, they have medicinal properties. Thank you. Thank you. And then in, on, in the front, right, the gentleman over there, thank you. Hi, hello. Um, I was just wondering in regards to the, everything that surrounds the drug war. So obviously it's not directly the policy in regards to the drugs, but also the weapons um, that obviously cross the border but the other way, um, especially to like Central American countries. Um, in regards to that, how then the drug policy, oh well, I, I was just wondering how does that affect that, like the kind of the rippling effect of changing the, the drug policy and the um, approach to this? Okay. The ripple effect internationally across... Mostly like in regards of if the drug policy changes then everything that surrounds this drug war, how does it, how, what, will, what will have to be done, for example? Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question up in front here and then I'll turn to the panel. Thank you, sir. I'm the Minister of Economy of Guatemala. Uh, so the, I want to, to address not only a question, but uh, maybe a statement. There is many hiding costs mm -hmm. of, the, of the, uh, the drugs war, because our countries, they have a, like a cost of opportunity. The investment that doesn't come to our countries because of the drug war, the investment that run away from our countries, so uh, there is a lot of uh, economic and social development that is not uh, getting in our countries because of the drug war. So it's not only the cost that we're putting in our budget to, to go against the, the, the drug, mm. but it's the, the cost of opportunity that we don't have mm. because of the uh, uh, drug war. So I would like to, to have some comments uh, uh, about that. But there is a, big hiding cost of uh, mm -hmm. that uh, war drug that we are fighting and as uh, our Minister of Interior said, mm -hmm. it's not even our war. Thank you very much. Now I will have to come back on a second round if I may. Could you hold off on this? I can turn now to the panel. 
Your Excellency, could I get you to speak to the questions that have been raised? My opinion, on the basis of how we are focusing this topic, and above all, proposing a debate, a deep debate, is this is doubtlessly, in the case of Guatemala, the role played by the government of the United States in defining a prohibitionist policy in the area is transcendental. What is the interpretation we give from the beginning when we talk about depenalizing or it was interpreted at some point in time, which was the same as decriminalization. This is how it was understood. And therefore, that we could talk about legalization as well. To define each of those fields of action is important. And when we talk about the shared and differentiated responsibility, this means how it affects the problem of the drugs uh, consuming, producing, and transit countries. Each will have to take different types of measures. Our problem is not a problem of consumption, it's a problem of transit through our territory. And as a consequence of this, of the collateral damage that the presence of guns and money towards the north, drugs, and uh, to the south, guns and money. This uh, creates the explosive potential for the endemic violence that the region has had as a consequence even of previous uh, armed conflicts. To have a dissident voice within the framework of the prohibitionist scheme, of course, has a cost. At the end of the day, how do we explain and rationalize our attention and participation? We're talking about not renouncing the drug war. What we're saying is that we're prepared to fight as it should be appropriate at different levels and in various ways, but mainly in what relates to us. And if we're involved in something else, it cannot be that we see ourselves compelled or forced or trapped in a vicious circle where we have no responsibility. On the topic, of course, of the therapeutic drugs, specifically in the case of Guatemala, Guatemala has, uh, what I said uh, some time ago, uh, is that there is a pr production of poppy fields. This. The, uh, the, the answer could be substitute culture uh, or to experiment on what could be a controlled uh, production for medicinal purposes. Like, for example, for the pharmaceutical industry to take what there is in that area, which today uh, the um, the Crops began in some rocky areas and now are around the houses or even in, among the population themselves around the schools. How that production, which is a reality today, we could convert it into an opportunity for uh, guiding it to beneficial aims rather than the ones that damage society. And of course, any change of policy, we know that the transformation and the turn that you can give to the policy is something extremely complex, and we have to see it from an integral kind of vision. But we, without any doubt, we believe that we have to begin with what we can do, what is ours. In, and in other words, any change has to be applied at different levels to just bring to the core of the debate the, the, the topic of drugs and to avoid and to deal it as it should be done is already a benefit. This, a few years ago, was considered um, impossible. 
today, we must make sure that it is a reality. And as the Minister of uh, the Economy said, we talked about the opportunity costs, uh, uh, meager resources that we could use in uh, education and health. We have to use them in strengthening the police, in uh, sending forces to repression areas, or interdiction in uh, some parts of the country. And these are our resources. The point is, if we're participating in an effort like this, we cannot, of course, be compelled, forced, using our resources and on top of that, threatened if we do not fulfill with some economic measure. This is outside the logic for a trusting country. Maybe I'll, t I'll take just the two first questions. Um, so the role in the U.S., um, it actually, I mean, I have a different view on this depending on how well our work goes at a, on a given day. Um, I like to think that things have changed. I'd like to think, I'm a big fan of President Obama, I'd like to think that things have changed and that they've changed for good. Um, but when I do travel, for example, to the Caribbean countries, they clearly are terrified of what the U.S. might say. Mm. At the same time, Uruguay happened, and nothing awful uh, resulted. So, uh, so again, uh, my sort of preferred uh, view at the moment is that things have changed and that U.S. Uh, has become neutral. Um, now, there is a more cynical view to this, which is, did the U.S. become neutral because it knows that someone else picked up the baton? Mm. So if one looks at Russia, which became extremely sort of uh, loud and prohibitionist in its uh, long-term drug policy goals, if one looks at Japan, if one looks at China, you know, maybe the U.S. doesn't have to, meet, uh, doesn't have to sort of articulate that as a goal anymore. Uh, understands that the political costs being a neighbor of Latin America are just way too high, and that's that's what we're seeing. So I'm not exactly sure. I'm not exactly sure how positive I feel. Um, for now, the evidence is that countries are pursuing in Latin America are pursuing uh, what they feel is sensible for them, and the U.S. is not intervening. Now, on the uh, illicit uh, on medical use of illicit substances, I, I just wanted to make one point. It's not that there's not enough opioids. It's just that the drug control regime makes it so complicated to import opioids that most of the poor countries simply do not have the machinery to do it. Because I think we often assume that there's just not enough opioids. Let's, let's, you know, let's have Afghan opium uh, turned into morphine and hand it out to everyone. That's, that's a complicated proposition. And it's not because it's, there's not enough substance. It's because countries just cannot deal with the machinery of importing it. Uh, Czech Republic, m many of you might have heard, over a year ago, Czech Parliament voted for medical availability of medical cannabis. As far as I know, until today, it's not available in Czech pharmacies. Mm -hmm. Basically, we've put together a huge bureaucratic machinery that makes it really hard for countries to act, even if they want to. And I think it is that machinery that we have to question. Thank you. Mark? I'd like to address the uh, therapeutic question as well. So yes, of course the opioids have therapeutic value. Of course the stimulants have therapeutic value. I don't think there's any doubt that the cannabinoids turn out to have therapeutic value, but the work hasn't been done. Right? If a medicine is a material of known chemical composition that a physician can prescribe to a patient with a predictable outcome, then there's not a cannabis medicine yet unless you want to count Sativex. Um, if I've got an infection, my physician does not say to me, you have an infection, I've heard antibiotics are good for that, try some antibiotic. She says, here's the prescription, 100 milligrams of amoxicillin, three times a day with meals for seven days. We're not at the point where anybody can write that prescription for cannabis medicines because the appropriate research hasn't been done. Um, you mentioned opioids for chronic pain. Well, it turns out that there's never been any research showing that opioids are useful for chronic pain. If you're in acute pain, opioids are the best thing ever. Mm. Nobody's ever evaluated 
opioid use past three months. And given the tolerance problem, it's not clear that all those people who are taking tons of opioids are actually getting anything out of it, except a problem. And of course, we have enormous problems with diverted opioid. I mean, there's much more diverted opioid abuse in the US than there is heroin abuse. Um, so that turns out to be complicated. And therefore, the control regimes are going to be complicated, though Gossi is right. They don't have to be as bad as they are now. Um, I'd just like to point out that therapeutic benefit is a subset of benefit. Pleasure is a benefit. And we ought to count that. Um, but in addition, with respect to drugs we have not mentioned so far tonight, with respect to the hallucinogens, psychedelics, and to the MDMA, methcathinone class, um, there are enormous personal growth, spiritual growth, creativity, and insight, enlightenment benefits, about which there is now some substantial research Right, so uh, uh, the group at Hopkins, uh, Roland Griffith's group, has demonstrated that you take somebody with some spiritual interest who's never used a hallucinogen, give him eight hours of psycho-spiritual preparation and a whopping dose of psilocybin in a controlled setting, <laughs> he has about a two-thirds chance of having a major mystical experience. <laughs> no, wait, wait a second. Which he will report to you Two years later, not having used any of that drug in the meantime, or to use two years later, was one of the five th most important things that ever happened in his life. Right? And his fa friends and family that you've recruited in advance for the research will report that he's behaving better. Right? These are enormous benefits that we're currently foregoing and which should not be well served by having LSD available at the chemists. Right? We've got to develop a whole new idea about what a distribution system would look like for drugs that are incredibly beneficial used correctly and a complete mess used incorrectly. So that, that's a longer story, but one we should not forego. Thank you, Mark. Um, I hope very much that we'll be able to have another round of discussion. But given the time that I know our panelists have to keep to, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I'm afraid we're, we're going to have to call the evening to a halt. Before everyone takes off, uh, let me say that we look forward very much to continuing these, these discussions, not just with governments, but with yourselves at LSE. I want to thank, first of all, you, the audience, for your interest and participation this evening, and then thank our speakers, Kaisha, Mark, His Excellency. If you could join me in thanking them for a most wonderful and interesting evening.